Hey guys, welcome to episode two of the Atlas podcast. This is Victoria Schmidt and I'm James Ayat. I'm going to go through a few questions you guys have asked me in Q and A's I've done before. The first question I'm ready to get into is reverse dieting. What is it? How do you do it? What does it entail, et cetera? You want to, would you like to start? Sure. A reverse diet, basically, it's the diet that you're going to start right after you finish your show. Let's say you have your show. Let's say your show is like on a Saturday night. Then you're going to have probably a cheat meal, right, on Saturday night. Then after that, maybe on the Sunday, you might enjoy a little breakfast. And then Sunday afternoon, I would say you go back to your reverse. A reverse diet is the same plan that you had before, but with higher calories. You slowly increase the calories back up. You can start building up your metabolism to either stabilize or slowly get into an off season and grow. I think it's important to say that a reverse diet is very important because first of all, if you don't follow one, you might blow up like a balloon because your body at a point in prep is like a sponge, right? Okay, let's relax. Let's go back to step one. Before we get into the talk about your shirt. My shirt. He says that it wasn't cute, but it I looks love like my a shirt. Grandma, I think. What do you guys think? No. But what's good is we're matching. Actually touch it. It's very smooth. It's horrible. It feels like a weird cat. <laughs> About reverse dieting. What you were saying basically is a reverse diet is something that you would start right after your competition. I agree that you would have a cheat meal right after the show. Try to avoid sugars. Don't bring oh, like sure. 20 cookies to the show. And people make the mistake. They bring like That's 20 a- cookies and muffins and cakes. And, it, and it's, then you start binging it's and everything. It's triggers. It's just going to trigger just you to a eat. terrible idea. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't bring, don't let, don't do that. Go have an HG meal with your family, like a steak, potato, vegetables, whatever. A little bit of sugar if you want, maybe like a a small dessert or something. Mm -hmm. Don't binge and eat candy and chocolate and everything. That's the worst idea you can do. First and foremost. Then the next morning, you can maybe have a little like nice breakfast with your family, Mm -hmm. but then get right back onto your reverse diet. If your coach didn't send you one yet, follow your initial plan that you had right before peak week, like your two weeks out diet. And your coach should have it too by, let's say, the day after the Monday, which you should start. Let's say I have a uh, client on about 1,200 calories. I'll probably send them a 15 to 1,600 calorie reverse diet. I'm not going to make them go just 1,300 calories because I want them to get back to maybe like a maintenance or a slight surplus. I don't want them to be starving or I don't want them to feel like they're still trying to, they're still losing body fat. I'm going to reduce their cardio by like like half and I'm going to increase their calories by probably four or 500 from where they were before. And if you execute this properly, you're going to have a really healthy metabolism, healthy hormones, and you're going to not gain too much body fat in your off season. The big mistake that girls make is they, or even guys, especially that you have a show, you binge everything you can possibly they think eat of for like you, a week till you can possibly eat after the show. Cause you feel like you're done and your diet's done. This goes back to our first podcast where we mentioned about having a healthy lifestyle. You would never do that in the off season, right? Binge and eat 20 donuts and candies. Why would you do that right after a show when you've been in a calorie restrictive state for so long, right? Mm-hmm. That's the worst time because as you diet down and you get into survival mode, your body is going to downregulate your metabolism because it wants to burn less calories so that you can survive. So when you start dieting down, you're even going to start like blinking less. You're going to move less because your body's going to try to exude less energy so that you can live off fewer amount of calories for long. That's why you're going to notice your cardio takes longer to do near the end. It's harder to bring your bring heart, heart rate, rate up, up because you're in a survival mode and your body yeah. doesn't want to burn calories. Once you've done your show, your metabolism is still going to be very slow. The lower your calories get, the slower your metabolism is going to get. And the leaner you get, it's the same thing. If you go and you start binging, eating 10 pounds of fat, right? And saying two or three days after your show, which should Sugar, ha- dairy, all the crap you can imagine. What you did is you just elevated your body fat, right? And you're going to hold tons of water as well. But your metabolism is still going to be in the shitter, right? So what you're doing is you're... Then, now you're starting with a much higher body fat than where you were. Metabolism is still where it is. Now you just screwed yourself because mm-hmm. to lose that fat and go back down, you're going to have to be in a calorie deficit for a much you're longer, have to which go is not, back. you don't want to go back to starving mm-hmm. or after a show, right? And if you want to get your body fat down again, that's what you're going to have to do. And if you don't want to do that, then your starting point is already 10 pounds where it was after the show, which is not fun. And right away, you already screwed up your metabolism probably for a little while. And you have to get into a reverse diet and then slowly go back up. But you're going to make the process much harder on you. You're going to look worse. You're going to feel a lot worse just because you decided to binge out for the show. You're not proud. Let's say you work no so hard. No one's good after doing that. No. no one, 
You're not going to eat all the pizza and donuts and be like, no. well, that was a good idea. You're, Absolutely You're going to feel horrible. It's going to feel good for like the 10 seconds that you have yeah. the food in your mouth. But then after that, you're going to feel like crap because your body is not used to that. Because first of all, these are not foods that you can digest properly. And imagine that you've been off all these foods for four months and now you start eating everything, everything. the night of and the week of. And it's your not, body... not even a bit. Like, no. Like, I've seen girls for like sure. donuts, pizza, ice cream, all in this. Like, are you Everything, crazy? the whole shebang. After you're just eating chicken, rice, and whatever for and four months. And then a lot of girls can gain 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds in the weeks after the show, which is completely unhealthy. You go from being in a state where you starve, a star starvation mode, a survival mode, to being able to eat everything. But then after that, you just screw up your metabolism. And it's just, like you said, it's a roller coaster. And it's just going to go back to being... A shit show. This is something that sometimes first time competitors do and they learn from it. If you're doing this after every show, you need to reevaluate why you're competing because you're not, you're, you're going to go into a yo thing where it's like you're unhealthy going down and then you're unhealthy going all the way back up. That's what we talked about on the first podcast. Yeah. This is not a habit you want to get into. You need to be able to have a regular, a good relationship meal after the show and get back to your reverse diet. And then you can, if you kill your reverse diet the first couple of weeks, your coach is going to probably incorporate cheat meals like, Every week or whatever after, and exactly. your obviously going to be much easier, and because your metabolism is going to get back it's going to adapt up, a lot quicker. Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you slowly increase the calories, you do things properly. Your metabolism is going to regulate itself and get quicker and quicker, and you're going to be able to eat more food. If you binge, gain 10, 15 pounds, and then you're already at a higher calorie intake than you were before, your metabolism is going to be like homologated, like all messed up. Your metabolism is going to be messed up. You're going to set yourself into in for a shit show. Yeah. And then you need four or five, six months to get back just to stable levels of body fat and hormones and everything. And you don't want to start your off season. In a bad way. In a very bad way. If it's your first show, okay, don't do it every show. And then one more thing, there's a couple like the top Olympian that does this and they show after every show, they have like pizza and go on YouTube and post 20 meals. This is such a bad example, example. that they're setting because Amateurs and for some people just watch this and they think that this is the normal, way to go. That Olympians yeah. do this. They don't do this. This is like one or two people that do this. And they said a really bad example. Is but it's not, not just that. Something you can do. And the only reason that they're doing this is because they have the genetics to do this. Exactly. But, then, it's sort of but it's not something that you should ever be doing, regardless of genetics or not. But like don't everyone follow has that. a different metabolism. And people, they can eat like crap and, oh, okay, they're lucky. Look, Their body doesn't react as bad as like me. I feel like example. Gina switched to you. Our client eats like 4,000 yeah. calories in the off-season, like 3,500 in prep. If she wants to go have donuts and pizza she after the show, it. she can do it because she's only 4,000 yeah. calories going to the show. But if you want a girl that's on 1,000 calories and then you go eat 5,000 calories one night or 6,000, you're setting yourself up for some damage. big damage to yeah. your hormones and as we said before. But we have a question for you. What's your question? How long is the reverse diet? Your first diet is your whole off season. You should always be in some type of diet. Just be like, okay, I'm going to do a 12-week prep cut. And then my off season is just eating whatever I want. There's as much protein, whatever. And just every cheat meals whenever I feel. You're never going to get anywhere to support. You need to have all the top Olympians of good pros that do the same thing. You have a decent diet plan in the off season where you're getting all your food and protein in the right amounts. And then you're having like cheat meals here and there that are like discussed or assigned with your coach. It's like you're on a structured plan all the time. But I think like the reverse itself is it's going to last, let's say. No, but I think reverse dieting is literally just your off-season diet. For sure it is. But it's just slowly you're bi building back up your metabolism to be able to increase your calories and stay at a healthy body fat level. Exactly. Let's say us what you do, you increase the calories after the clients competed for, let's say, 500 calories. And then let's say you reassess the week after or two weeks after how the body actually like stabilizes stay exactly after a week or two on the plan and then let's say the person drop weight on that plan well you can increase the calories yeah, if you're still losing body fat on the increased calories say the next check and then i'll increase your food or maybe add a cheat meal that's it if your weight jumps up a lot then it may have to pull back a little bit or add a little bit more cardio back you know so you don't want to start like the worst thing you can do is you do a show you binge and then you just stop all your pds that you're on if you're taking any pds it's yeah like you're setting yourself up for catastrophe everything needs to gradually go down and then come back up you need to relax come back to have a structure don't ghost your coach for two or three weeks after the show and then you come back and you're 40 pounds more this is you can't i've seen this happen sometimes you're gonna sucks. be sad and we're gonna be sad and everyone's it's, gonna be we're gonna sad. cry together for sure your body's gonna cry and your mental health too and that's also so important
If you feel like crap, everything around you is going to be crap. It's an individual sport, right? It's your yeah. life. It's your body. It's your, your mental choices. health. Every, it's your choice yeah. that you make after the show. And I hope this, I've been saying this for eight years since I've started coaching how important reverse diet is because I've seen reverse diet is starting off off season with success or an absolute failure. It's true. And if you do this after every show and you reverse diet properly and you get into a good off season, then you're going to have a much longer and healthier contest career or competing career, right? You have every show you're yo-yoing and binging up and down and you're just, you're not going to get far. And if you do, it's because you have great genetics and good for you and you're lucky. You know, you're but lucky, but. That's not something you need to, it, to do. Whether it's luck or not, it's still not healthy. Exactly. It's not healthy to do it's that. It's not healthy. Even, Even if though. your genetics are great and yes, you're doing that, it's still unhealthy to do It's unhealthy. Next I question. know point where you're eating 6,000 calories in one sitting where you've been eating 1,000 calories for eight weeks, whatever I'd say, is that healthy in any way? Oh, for sure. For whatever sure. clients like, I just show, what can I eat? I say. For dinner with your family, enjoy yourself, have a steak, potatoes, rice, some vegetables, maybe a little, maybe a cookie or something. Don't go nuts. No, and don't go don't, crazy. Yeah. Go slowly. Increase your food slowly. For sure, you're going to want to eat everything. And like on social media, people have crazy cheat meals and stuff. But social media is social media. You got to remember that. And also what's best, what's, what someone does is not the best for you necessarily. You don't have to copy everyone. You just have to do what's right for you. And I think what's super important is to have a nice structure and a nice plan given by your coach, which you always do. You always send the reverse diet the day of the show or like the yeah, day I after, think I try, you know? I try to do it the morning of the next day or the night of the show. There's no excuse for them to start like... No, you start, start reverse diet. on the right track the day after. You get your cardio done. You slowly get back to your regular like discipline routine and you're yeah, going to feel good. Don't stop cardio too. Like I have some... I've seen this. I've had it in a couple of clients. In the last eight years, I gained like 70, 80 pounds after the show. And what they do, not a week, but in a couple months, which is yeah. still horrible. But they, they go to show, they stop their PDs. Actually, both the clients were natural. So that's another thing too, is I forget to, girls are like, if I take PDs, am I going to rebound after a show? It is 100%, not depending on the PDs, it is dependent on if you continue reverse dieting, cardio, your training after the show. Yeah. If you want every PD in the world, right? And then you binge after a show and you stop your cardio, you're going to you're gonna explode. My two girls that gained 70, 80 pounds after the show were natural athletes. They just stopped the cardio, stopped the training, and just ate everything they could see for weeks at a time and just lost complete control. And then and it's hard to get back to your regular to your regular you after no, that. It could take a year, it could take two years. It's yeah, awful. It's you're, awful. You, no, that's such so a disaster. It's not the PDs that are going to do that. It's First of all, you got to, if you're taking PDs, you need to gradually come off them ask your coach but it's 95 percent the reverse dieting yeah keep doing your cardio keep doing your training don't go from extreme to another extreme which is doing everything to doing nothing that's exactly that's how you're gonna set yourself up for some serious psychological and physical damage question number two how to become a successful coach i guess i'll start this off i made a couple of stories about this in the past over the years but you're gonna start off with absolutely no clients and how I started Nothing. off is I actually, I mentioned in podcast number one that I was an entrepreneur for, since I was 15 years old, I started a company, bought my first house in full when I was 17 years old. That's not something that is typical, but it's something that I did because I, oh, I just have an entrepreneurial mindset. And I've had that since, I think it's something, I think it's a lot of instinct and when you're born, it's something you can develop and get better at, but I think some people have it and some people don't. It was, I had it in me and I got it from my mom, actually. Mom was the same. I had a company until I was like 21, 22. And then I just, I got sick of what I was doing. We we're doing like online service business. I was 16 years old and we had like 20 employees at 16 years old. I was a little boss when I was a kid. <laughs> and then I graduated college and then I, it was actually going to be like a damage insurance broker, like an insurance firm. And then I realized that insurance is extremely boring. I didn't pursue that at all. And then I, I got extremely fat. Actually, I was 322 pounds. I think I was like 20 years old because I was on the computer 20 hours a day working. And I just didn't care about, I didn't know anything about nutrition, diet, I knew nothing. I just ate everything and pizza and Coca-Cola and just got fat. And then one day I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm super fat. I need to fix this. And then a year and a half, I lost 140 pounds. I did it all myself. I did all my diet myself. I learned things online. And then I was in the gym like four hours a day. I was just addicted to the gym. I went to one of my friend's competitions, a random girl in the gym, and she like won the show. And I was like, I asked her, I'm like, can I coach you for your next show? I'm like, I don't really know anything about it, but I really like this whole competing thing. And I... I've been learning a lot online and she's like, yes. And then I did it and we won like the overall at her show. And then I was hooked. 
And then the next show I had, I got three athletes. I found them in the gym. I'd be like, hey, you look like you look good. You want to do a competition? They're like, you were a hustler in the gym. I was a hustler. I, you, you have to. When you he was off. going to see everyone. Anyone that looked like they could. <laughs> looked good on the stage. kind of good. <laughs> No, but like that I can coach and they yeah. have some type of foundation. I, would, I went, to, I like would message like people on a Facebook that even know me. Hey, you think of doing bodybuilding competition? Like local, it was like local Facebook book groups that I would like trying to like look for clients. Like from <laughs> nothing, like absolutely nothing. Went to the gym with no name. Being like, Listen, I don't have any experience, but I think that we can do good together based on what I've learned far. And if you give me a chance, I would appreciate it. And I would like, coach up a couple of people for free or do a 12 week prep for $300. Like enough grinding you have to grind to start that's the way every coach has to start and if you think you're gonna like just post on instagram and start getting clients and build a reputation of like that it's not gonna work you need to realize that you're nothing and you need to build from nothing when it's gonna start it's gonna be hard you're not gonna make a lot of money to start i made barely anything my first year my second year barely anything and then after that like i picking up an hour now we have uh, hundreds of clients that's the Your first, that's, that's how you, off. but that's like an entrepreneurial mindset you got to realize you can't be given to, you need to just get out there and do it. And I had some clients come to me like, how do you start this? How do you become a coach? And I never asked anyone, how do you become a coach? You got to just do it. That's an entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm like, how do I start a business? Like you can fit. We have so much access with our internet and our phone. Anything you need to know is on your phone. Anything mm -hmm. you need to know. But if you're asking all these questions, you're, you're a little bit lazy. You know, you need to really, yeah. like, you can have a mentor and people that help guide you, but get started. Like just start no one told me okay james now you have to go talk to clients in the gym and try to find people to join your team no i just like did it i had a guy help me find like my team my name team atlas and made little shirts team atlas on it i got an office in a gym i just i just little things I, I suddenly started i bought a camera and i started recording myself training clients and making these like little videos from like 2015 i just and i started like editing them myself and i just did so much many things that I learned from being an entrepreneur when I was 15 years old and I moved that over to coaching. That's how you're going to have to start. If you don't want to hustle, you want to start from nothing, don't even bother. Go work for someone else. And uh, I mean, you had it within you. It's not everyone that has it. Yeah, like, but no, if you don't have it in you, I mean, try and if you really just, you can't. I think you know that you have it within you or not. There's some people that are just willing to have a nine to five, Monday to Friday, every day of their life and just be a little. Just, there's benefits to having, working for, for someone sure. too and being honest. For sure. Like, you go to work at nine to five and you come home. You have a rest. steady paycheck. Yeah, you, you don't think. Rest. But me, I literally haven't had a day off in seven years. Yeah, you so work every day of your work life. Every day. He doesn't sleep, the guy. I sleep sometimes, but not that much. Sleep. I'll sleep in September. <laughs> Soon. In a week after North American. Yeah, exactly. Going back to the question of how do you become a successful coach? You need to have results or you need to keep learning, right? If you think you know everything, you don't and you never will. We've made 78 pros now since 2018. I make the most pro cards in the world for the past going to be three years in a row now for the bikini category out of any single code. And I'm still learning. I've had, I think we qualified 21 girls to Olympia or 21 Olympic qualifications, whatever it is. We had 11 girls at the Olympia last year and I'm still learning every show. If you're a beginner, you have one athlete or that you turn pro and you think you're done learning everything, you're never going to get to the top mm -hmm. because you don't know everything. And I don't know everything either. I learn every show. Look at Look what happened with East at the first show. I didn't expect that to happen and it happened. I'm like, fuck, I need to, to problem solve and troubleshoot the situation and be able to solve this next time. I look back at all the data I had on her prep and I was able to solve it for week two. You're learning with every show, you're learning with every athlete. I learned a lot of crucial details too with even beginner athletes when I do shows. I'm like, oh man, this, I, I learn from athletes even though they don't even know that they're teaching me things. Mm -hmm. You need to keep learning. You need to be able, willing to grind. You need to be consistent. If you're, it takes you a week to answer clients' check-ins and you're, there are your, it takes a week to send the diets and you, you're not organized and you forget to talk to them on the show day and you're, you make them feel like they're like a number or not like an athlete or yeah. all these things are, you're never going to get, or you're going to get there and you're going to lose clients. There's a couple, there's one, especially big team. They're very good at marketing. Uh, it's not Fit Body Fusion. I really like Jamie a lot. Just it's not that team. <laughs> she does a very good job, but it's another team and they're very good at marketing. But then the athletes join, especially the beginners, they join your team. And I'm sure they're not taken care of. They just, they do one show, then they leave. You can be good at marketing and stuff too, but if you want to keep clients consistent, clients are the amateurs, you got to take care of them because they're your bread and butter. And I mentioned this before too. If you're just taking care of your Olympians and your pros, you ignore your amateurs. First of all, you're doing a very big disservice to the industry because the amateurs are what's making you all the money and making all the shows. If and you they're have the no, future too. If you have no amateurs, you have no competitions. Bodybuilding does not exist. Because the pros aren't paying to do the competitions. The amateurs are paying for the MPC Pro card. They're paying for the coaching. They're paying for the shows. Classes. They're every, everything. Everything is about the amateurs. 
if you're just taking care of your pros, you're doing a disservice to the to everyone. And it sucks because the amateurs they don't know any better and they join like a big team. They think that oh, it's gonna be great, and and then they have a bad experience. Like I feel like I didn't look good on stage. I wasn't taken care of, and why am I fat on stage and my posing sucks? Like you know, I expected a lot more, and it's because a lot of the energy is put into the the best athletes on the team. That's not a good infrastructure to have because you're gonna ruin your reputation. You're gonna ruin the experience for the clients. I'm especially too you're hurting the industry something. because let's say a client has a, ba- a first time competitor has a bad experience. They go on stage, come less and last, and they're fat, and they have a top coach. Like did well, that they're like I hired the best coach. I did everything they said, and I don't look good. And they're like, "Fuck this! Maybe competing is not for me." And like, you just ruin everything. Yeah. Then you just had a, a potential client that could have been beneficial for the promoters, for the other coaches. Have just gone from the industry. You, know, so you don't want to do that, and it's really disrespectful to have someone put all their time and energy and money and sacrifice, and then you don't give them the time of day because they're an amateur first time competitor. And know? it's good that you're actually conscious about that, because there's people that just do it for the money, right? But he actually doesn't do it for the money. You're actually passionate by the sport. If you think you're going to start coaching for the money and you're going to be good, forget it. Forget, forget it. it. You're yeah. going to have to be, you're going to have to freaking eat some shit for a long time and yep. coach athletes who don't want to coach and do things that you don't you know, want to do because you're grinding. And you need to love it. Like my old posing coach, she mentioned that I was, I would go and sit in person to all of my clients posing classes for five, six, seven hours a day. To just learn and watch the first two, three years of my coaching because I wanted to learn, right? And I would go to the gym and I would sit through with my old older coach and she would do in-person sessions and I would sit there and watch and learn and observe like a baby. Mm-hmm. Even when I turned athlete pro, I would still sit there and watch the and glasses. I would learn and be like, oh, okay. And then I would like, now like I have a really good eye for posing because I learned myself. You got to put in the time. You got to keep learning and you got to love it and be passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it and you're trying to make it with the money, you're not going to work. You're not going to get the results. Clients are going to see that you suck mm-hmm. and then you're not giving them attention and they're going to leave and go to someone else. Yeah. And I see this often. There's really big teams that do great and then they lose the passion and they're... They go down. They, no one even talks about them anymore because they have no more clients. They literally... This has happened... I talked to Kim Oda about this actually and he told me this happened. He, Kim Oda's been coaching since nine or something and he told me like this happens often. Teams get big and they have a million coaches and they, they're like... They're the dominant monopoly of the industry. And then two, three years later, they lose all the coaches and they have no more athletes and no one even talks about them anymore because it's just they get too big that they collapse. Mm-hmm. And then they, the coach just says, fuck they this. Lose and then, they lose control. They lose control and yeah. you, you lose passion and you realize it's just like a big money thing and then you just, you have everything and then you it turns to nothing. Stay in your lanes. Focus on what you can control. Don't take more athletes than you can take on and give everyone equal attention to the best of your ability and you feel like you're falling behind. Either reduce your roster, don't take any more clients, or increase your prices. You have to take less clients or hire help to help you in some way. But don't just do this for money because it's not going to work out for you or your athletes. Mm-hmm. I think that's the kind of the just a general statement of what is required to be a successful coach. And also, you need the eye. You need skill, right? Not everyone has the eye. You can't teach the eye really to anyone. You can show people what you want, but you need to have the eye for the category that you want to be good at. You can be good at every category. Maybe it was like Shane Hughley who's like good at every single category he's very good at every category but like to be the best in the world at something you got to be focused on one category maybe two maximum Mm -hmm. like bikini maybe also wellness but focus on mainly one bodybuilding maybe classic there's no coach that's the best at men's physique and the best at bikini and the best at wellness together it does not exist because there's too many variables you need to really focus on one thing i do bikini 12 to 18 hours a day every day Seven days a week. It's mm-hmm. all I'm looking at. It's all I'm knowing. It's all my sleep, think, breathe is bikini, <laughs> posing, everything. You know, it's like, it's true. And I still make mistakes sometimes. But imagine I'm doing that plus men's physique plus bodybuilding. Forget it. Pretty- I've actually made pros in men's physique and I made a classic pro figure wellness. I had Olympian wellness too, but like I've had a lot more success when I focus on one category. For sure. And I give it my all. That's, I think that's a general good advice for how to be a successful coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, next question When should you start posing? I think you should. Start posing as soon as you know that you want to compete. Posing is, it's hard. It's hard. So hard. There's so many different things that goes into posing. What's right for someone is probably wrong for you. Everyone is different. Everyone has a different foot position, a different hip, a different, everyone is different. As soon as you know that you want to start competing, you should start posing. First of all, it's not everyone that's comfortable with heels. You should learn how to walk with heels. 
You should learn how to be comfortable with heels. You should learn how to pose with heels. Then after that, once you're comfortable with that, you start posing, doing your front pose. Once you master that, you go to the next position, side glute, back pose. It's really, I teach personally every position one at a time. I make sure that all my clients understand every position. You're not going to teach them front, back, transitions, no. walk in one session. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make You're sense. You're going to forget everything. It's always one position at a time. And if you don't get their front pose, one pose at a time. we Does finish. It? Yes. One... Position sounds weird. <laughs> one pose at a time. And it's always, if you don't get your front pose, we don't go to the side position. It's really one position at a time. And I want to make sure that all my athletes understand what they're doing. I explain to them what they should do. And I want them to actually feel their body. Mind-muscle connection is super important when you train, but it's also super important when you do posing. Because think about it. On stage, there's not going to be any mirror. You're not going to be able to address yourself. So you should be able to learn how to feel and fix your body yourself just by what feels right and what feels wrong. And if it feels right, it's probably wrong because posing is not comfortable, right? I think everyone could be a good poser. Not everyone could be an amazing poser because yeah. you need to have it in you. Yeah. Like Victoria, like if you see her on stage, it's wow. She just shines. Like she has the confidence. She has the it factor. That's another thing too. Like the it factor is. Like, you have it or you, you don't. You, it's hard to, you can get better at it, but it's like when a girl like walks on stage and everyone looks at her and they're like, oh my God, it's like a girl that walks into a room, right? And everyone, everyone takes a double take and they're like, Wow, there's something about the presence or like the, the aura, aura of the girl. Even a man, like a very like good looking man, it's like true. tall, look Take confident. Space. Just room, you know. Like, the energy, the yeah. vibe, the the I think the confidence is everything you can't on. Really teach that. It's like in the You room. have it in you. Yeah. I mean, you have to be a little bit like this in your everyday life to be like this on a stage. Almost all the top Olympians have it though. That's a part of being a top Olympian. I think so too, yeah. but that's why they're the best in the world, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many athletes, but there's just a little bit of Olympians because they're the best. It's like Olympians. I'm saying not all the, the top Olympians have the id factor, but um, all not the 75. I've seen the top Olympians, like, say like the yeah, top 10, exactly. they all have like the yes. id factor, you know? A hundred percent, but it's not everyone that has it yeah. for sure. It's hard. It's, it's all hard about to your get smile, it. how you look, keep your chest up, your broad, how you walk, how you... Everything how you about showcase it. yourself, the sassiness. How you carry yourself. Yes, how you carry yourself. It's like you're talking to the judges without talking to them. So you Capturing need to, your attention. Exactly. So you need to be able to sell your body, but without selling your body. Don't, but sell, a, don't, don't tell them to sell their body. <laughs> not selling your body, but you're showcasing your body in a way that is going to attract the, the judge's eyes. And that's just by learning how to pose correctly and what is right for you. The question is, you should start posing as soon as you know that you want to compete because yeah. it takes a long ass time. If you're waiting till six weeks out to start calling, to start posing, you're screwed. And if you don't book classes on a regular basis, let's say every week, every second week, once a month, whatever, it's even harder. You need to stay consistent. For me personally, I always recommend all my clients to book in the off season every three, four weeks. Just so you stay consistent. You keep practicing. You keep showing up. If you have any questions, you can ask them to me. Uh, we keep improving for sure. And then in prep, uh, some clients book literally three times a week, once a week, twice a week, once every second week. Everyone is different. Don't do less than once every two weeks because it's like you're going to forget things. And oh, for sure. you want to build good habits too. If you Don't learn off YouTube. Don't learn off like local posing coaches. You need to learn from a professional. And, and you can't even, compare yourself too. I have so many clients yeah, sometimes all, different. that they're like, but this girl's doing that. I'm like, matter. yes, she's doing that. But yeah. now you try to pose right? like Issa Bashini and tell me how you look. But I actually had a client that talked to spoke to me about Issa. And I was like, but Issa is Issa. It's her physique. Her foot is like that because it's her. Your foot is like that because it's you. Everyone is different. Just listen to me. Listen to James. Like we correct you and that's our job for a reason. And this you is know? why too. We have Victoria's that May exclusive posing coach of Team Aras. And then we have another one that's Victoria is one of her best friends. She's her assistant coach. She'll go through the beginners. And Victoria taught her and I taught Victoria what I like. We all have very good synergy. This is why I don't let my athletes pose with other people because other posing teachers like different things. They have things. different things. And they have different looks and, not, not, and they're not necessarily correct. But no. like, if they're teaching you something and I'm, I like something else and we don't have synergy. I coach hundreds of girls, right? know a lot about different bodies. They might yeah. be teaching you the same thing that they know on themselves. Exactly. Instead of, because they don't have enough experience with coaching many girls. And even if they do have a lot of experience with coaching many girls, they might have a different eye than you. And then you're teaching the client two different things and it gets confusing. So that's why I make all my athletes 
Well, there's Victoria or Lee Nuts because they both know exactly what I like and we have communication. And it's just a lot simpler to have. We work together, this, this right? This goes back to podcast number one. I said having a good infrastructure, everything runs smoothly, right? A so good if synergy. I didn't, if I didn't have a good, if I didn't have an exclusive posing coach and I let my athletes pose with whoever they want, I would make a lot less Olympians. I would have a lot less pro cards because there would be no synergy between the posing coach and me because we're, we like different things and it's just, the clients are doing weird things and it's just too Let's complicated. say your other posing coach teaches you something, but then you send us your check-in and it's no, Completely different don't do than, that. What, than what I like. Then you're like, what the hell? I just paid for a session with this posing coach that told me to place my foot like this. Yes, but it's wrong. I think, you know? let's say that happens to me and Victoria. Sometimes we have a little difference of opinion, but I'll like, I can tell Victoria I want it like this and she'll be like, okay, no problem. And then just, she'll fix it. But it's a lot easier and a good infrastructure with the team. You have one coach, a posing coach. We have to get another one because Victoria couldn't, we had many clients Victoria couldn't physically take on anymore. Exactly. So we have one that does the beginners and then once they're ready, they transition to Victoria. Yeah. That's very important as far as when you should start right away in your off season because mm -hmm. you want, you have to work on flexibility, hip mobility, lower back flexibility, like there's so many things that goes so into it. So many things, your stretches, your vacuum. There's a lot. There's a lot and that goes into it. if you think you're going to start posing 10 weeks out and be a great poser, good luck to you. Good luck to you. It's possible, but, if, yeah, but if you it's not the it's norm. It's rare. It's also if you're like already like crazy flexible, you already have a like very good Arch background and, and you're and a very quick learner. It's rare. Like, it's really rare. Some girls like posing is their biggest weakness. We have some girls that have been with us for five years and still their posing is like good, Average. but it's not, no, but it's good, but it's not like perfection. Yes, you know? exactly. Everyone can improve and even pros. There's mm -hmm. always space for improvement at all levels you and know this goes back to podcast number one too where he said prioritizing prep like yeah posing needs to be a huge priority in bikini if you don't know how to tilt your hips perfectly to the judges and this is something i was working on with isa too i don't want to give it away because maybe some judges are going to watch this and see <laughs> like some faults on her physique but there's some things that we had to fix on her body so that she's balanced properly showing to the judges like her hip placement and her mm -hmm. waist placement and stuff too. It's like if you're on the, the the first call out, whatever, and the head judge is in the middle and you're off to the side and you're posing for your grandma in the back and you're not angling to the head judges, mm -hmm. all of the work you did, all the dieting, all the cardio, all the workouts, everything you did in the garbage because the judges can't see your physique. If you don't know how to pose, but you do, my coach, my coach, I did my diet and my, my cardio and my workouts and I did everything you told me to do. But you didn't but, showcase but your physique once every six properly. Weeks, you can't hold your stomach in for two seconds and oh it doesn't matter because the judges could only judge on what they can see and if you can't display it the like, judges don't nothing. know don't know what you did during your prep they, they don't just, care they don't care they see your 15 seconds on stage or your 60 second presentation and how you compare and if you can and then, if you have the confidence if you have the perfect front and back pose if you know how to transition if you keep your glutes out if you don't drop your glutes if you can walk like you need to have all these aspects and if you don't have that in you we did everything else it does not matter no if you trained your cardio with your posing we didn't tie it Nothing matters. If you did your cardio, your posing, and your nutrition, but you never trained, nothing matters. You need all four. You need cardio, you need training, you need nutrition, and you need posing. All four. If you're missing one, you have nothing. It means nothing. It's true. It's true. All four together. So start posing immediately. Start follow your proper stretching protocol that your coach gives you immediately. And start booking class with someone that you trust immediately too. In the offseason and in prep, so you can have everything is perfect. My best clients that turn pro are the ones that do the do everything. Oh, your clients do their work. There's some clients that never turn pro because they're like, they uh, lack in one aspect. One aspect, like oh, I didn't get my posing in. Oh, I cheat here and there, and it's always the same thing over and over. And they never reverse diet. It's like, you got to have all four. You got to be consistent on all four aspects to be a successful. In athlete. prep and in off season. Yes, not just in prep, in off season yeah. too. Yeah, it's all the time. All day, every day. Let's do one more question. The last question was belt and waist trainer usage. What do you think about that? I think it is useful, definitely. In prep, it's great. I loved it during my prep because I actually felt snatched. Actually, I love that word. It's funny. The snatched? Snatched. I think it's good. I think there's levels to it, though. I don't think it's actually good to wear it all day and all night. That can cause many... Yeah. issues digestive issues like i had a client last year that she has so many bad digestive issues and it was actually because of her waist trainer you think because... it was only because of that no it was actually because of that it because i'm gonna tell you after 
but it's because she was sleeping. With, it's because oh, she was sleeping with an auntie. Yes, uh, she was sleeping with her waist trainer, and that is right. not good. Like everything yeah, that I you think do in an waist extreme, eight hours a day. Eight hours a day for sure. Everything that you do in an extreme is not good. Wearing your waist trainer for twenty four hours a day, seventy seven hours a so you're week. You have lower back issues too. But for sure, it's not good. It's going to squish your organs at this point. So there's a thing like, well, does waist trainer actually shrink your waist? You see those crazy people on YouTube, whatever, that have like those corsets, and then yeah. It obviously works because it, it, look at their waist. It looks like it's, that's it's it. disgusting. But that's that, not that, like that, a waist trainer. No, it's a corset, but yeah. you can shrink your waist down. By oh, using definitely. It appropriately. And your posture Your posture too. too. It keeps yeah. your, your chest up really high. Victoria said it really helped yeah. with that. And it's going to keep a bit of strain on your belly. You're going to want to keep your belly in all the time, which is a very important thing to even do your off season. If you have your belly hanging out mm -hmm. or you're training or anything, you're going to have a lot harder time doing vacuums to keep yourself on stage. 100%. These are girls trained. They're literally like, their stomach is like a little Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's another reason why you wear a belt. It's like, it keeps your, it keeps core, your core tight. tight and it makes you have to suck in a little bit all the time to build good habits. Exactly. Posing is about that too. It's about building good habits. Back to posing for one second. If you're learning the wrong things from the wrong people or learning YouTube or Instagram things and you're building bad habits, like shaking your arm all the time or it's hard to break. Visit. It's hard to break. Uh, like, learn from the start the right things with the right people. That's true though. You, you... All our clients say that all the time. Let's say I, I, I teach something new. And then they go back to what they're used oh, to do. Man. And then they're like, oh, I'm sorry. It's because it's, ba it's bad habits. Exactly. Get out of there. A, I have some clients, like one of them now I'm talking about. She always bends her arm in her front pose. And it's not just hers a lot, but they put it down. And it's just, it's such a habit she's had forever. That's just like mm -hmm. it's so hard to break. And she's have a, when your coach tells you to switch a pose or fix something, write it down or consciously always think about it. If you just. If you get information from your coach, it goes in one ear out the other, and you have to tell you the same thing every check-in, that's on you. You should write it down before you pose. Every time you read over, okay, I got to put my arm down. Okay, I got to keep my waist to the side. You got to do okay, your homework. Okay, I got to lift my back shoulder. You need to write things down and read it over and over again. Mm -hmm. If you're just like, you look at a piece, it's like reading a book, but you don't remember anything because you're not really reading it. You're not take, processing take anything. Take the information and process it yeah. and apply it to what you're doing. A hundred percent. If I have some check-ins where I literally tell the same thing, ten times in a row and it's you're not processing this information you're literally just reading it and you're just not doing no you're it. like there but you're not it's there it's so frustrating yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating yeah yeah it's like in class i'm like but i understand your, your carbs might be lower your diet is slow you're doing a lot of cardio so it might yeah, be slower but this is why you learn the good habits in the off season exactly you start way you back tons of food and you're eating stuff yeah yeah and you can process everything a lot easier your brain is clearer yeah back than to Back like to the best. I think it's good to keep your core tight. It improve it improves your posture definitely. And it's gonna help keep a lot of um, strain off your lower back and yep. avoid help. You don't want to build lower back muscle really in bikini because it makes your your overall core thicker. It mm -hmm. helps atrophy your lower back muscles and it's gonna keep your make your waist a lot smaller. If you have a girl with a small waist in the front but then a big lower back, her entire waist is gonna look a lot thicker. So you really want to atrophy your lower back muscles and the belt and waist trainer is gonna help that, especially when you're training. I always and wear my waist trainer during my cardio. I love it. It helps me to sweat as well. And I just feel like super and the tight. Training too, and too, even if you're training shoulders and you don't really have a lot of like lower back movement still wear your belt to build good habits with your belly and your I mean, keeping your core in you should always have your belt on. competitors you, it's should, should it. It on. you should always have it on because we all know you want to have big glutes and a small waist can you do you train your glutes and then you keep your waist as tight as possible you put all the, the chances on your side to have the smallest waist possible mm -hmm. i think it's good for sure for yeah, bikini competitors too. waist trainer yes Eight hours a day max, work up to it and make sure it's yep. like tight enough where it's, if you just have a loose waist trainer, nothing's going to happen. But no, you need to change it. You train for sure. always. Obviously, yep. you wear a belt when you do cardio, wear a belt when you train. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can wear a waist trainer too while you do cardio or train, whichever one feels better on you. But it needs I think to be it's very tight. Important. You know, if you feel like it's loose, for sure it's not doing the trick. You need to feel like it's tight and if it's you're keeping an you an absolute uh... beginner and like absolutely no muscle at all. Like no core strength, then maybe don't wear a belt. Just build some type of. No, like, you need to build muscle. Build a little bit of core. Like lower, just a little bit of core strength sure. and like overall. Then you can start incorporating a belt when you have a bit more experience. But for when you feel ninety five percent of the people, you should be wearing for competitors. For competitors, for yeah. bikini girls, for sure. For lifestyle people, whatever. But do you, for, wear, do you still wear a belt when you train or no? Not really. No, no, Sometimes, but it's just rare doing, because I don't train as yeah, heavy. Yeah, she doesn't care about. Being super small waist with no lower no. back, and she's not competing, right? She's just trying to be healthy. No, actually, I'm trying to build abs. You're trying to build what? Abs. Not abs. I said abs, eh? With the H, I know, but no, I meant to say abs. 
I'm building Show us an abs. Abs. What do you do for abs show? I do leg raises. I do planks. I do crunches. Only with body weight, though. Never with yeah, never with, with body weight. weight. But that's for competitors, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it's that's why I'm not wearing a belt. I actually want to build my core. Something you want to do as a bikini athlete? No. If, if you're, you're competing for yeah. a little bit of abs, you can yeah. just to build a little bit more definition. But you, never with uh, weights. Always with body weight. I know. Well, for bikini, obviously. you don't want abs on stage. Yeah, you, you don't want you want a flat stomach. stomach. If someone has really have no abs at all, you can train mm -hmm. a little bit of abs. Just to build no a little bit of core. No lower back and just a little bit of upper and lower abs, like body weight crunches and lying leg raises. That's it. I would say plank. Plank. You yeah, don't move. Yeah, but that's more transverse to dominance. It's not upper and lower abs, really. I mean, you were. Uh, yeah, go do a plank there. Why? I'm going to have abs after I do a plank? <laughs> it's, You're going to feel it everywhere. Yeah, I'm going to feel it, but it's more transverse. So you can have planks if you want to, but good. Yes. I think that's going to conclude our podcast number two. Number two. I really appreciate you guys coming to tune into our Atlas podcast, and we'll try to get you, we'll try to get you an episode once every week. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments or send me a DM. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Ciao.